Now you talk about terror. What about for me? I've been terrorized all my day. Hammer all my day. As a member of the U.S. Congress for 16 years, Dennis Kucinich gave over 500 speeches warning about the consequences of U.S. wars against Afghanistan, the Balkans, Iraq, Iran, Libya, and Syria. He also spoke out for the imperative of peace in the Middle East on behalf of Israelis and Palestinians. He met with leaders of many countries who were grappling to keep their nations out of conflicts and came to understand the role some in the U.S. government have played to intentionally catalyze war, fueling arms sales globally without regard for the consequences. Dennis warns that we, in his words, are cartwheeling towards a massive East versus West war with religious and ethnic overtones. This seemingly inexorable march of nuclear folly may, he writes, pit the United States militarily against China, Russia, and their allies. Joining me to discuss how, as he writes, the polarization of U.S. politics, the cognitively impaired and failing executive branch, the instability of the congressional leadership, the pure blind partisanship, the ideologically clickbait driven media has produced a mad bloodlust for war against Iran and perhaps China and Russia, is Dennis Kucinich. You have fought the war industry with probably more consistency and courage than any U.S. politician. You've paid the price for it. Uh, But let's just lay out globally the reach of the war industry and how it functions and why it seems to be beyond the control of of any of either political party. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chris, for that introduction. And thank you for the opportunity to be on your show. Um, We are in a moment of peril, and the subtext of it, or maybe the context of it, begins with the fact that the United States has over 800 bases around the globe. Uh, This has has been a part and parcel of an attempt by America to use its military power to be able to control uh, not just the politics of a country, but an economics of a country, and to stop uh, the uh, rise of any uh, counterforce in the uh, in the world. Of course, we know that uh, that was uh, vainglorious. Uh, the efforts have failed. And notwithstanding the fact that we have this uh, archipelago of bases uh, around the world, we have slipped from a position of uh, unipolar leadership to a uh, moving to a multipolar world, which uh, the United States has less and less influence upon, with the exception of certain economic moves that can be made to try to hamstring the economies of various countries through sanctions. Now, where this all begins is at the appropriations process. The uh, military-industrial complex that Eisenhower so famously warned us about in uh, January of 1961 uh, has uh, uh, every district of the United States, every congressional district has programs and projects in it that require funding and are put into an appropriations bill. Lobbyists confront members of Congress uh, from their own community saying, we need this for the jobs in our community. And together you have uh, a, um, a, a defense production establishment, which is, uh, a, a glo- you know, which is nationwide, and it has enormous influence with individual members. Now, beyond that, you have the, uh, when members of Congress come in and they take an oath to defend the Constitution, unfortunately, for many members of Congress, uh, that means to just sign on to any military action which the administration recommends. And so there's very little uh, deep thinking that goes on, uh, especially where the money's going to come from, because the 31 trillion plus uh, uh, national debt, which the United States has a substantial part of that, it comes from the country putting uh, wars on a credit card. Uh, so ingrained into our system, is the funding of wars and uh, and the 
um, and a perpetuation of conflict. Because if you're making all these iron material, you've got to use them. <laughs> and the more that you use, the more you make. And there's a continuous loop here of money that just pours in. Uh, right now, we're close to a trillion dollars in, uh, in this uh, particular fiscal year 2023 for the uh, Pentagon plus the various intelligence services. And so that then is, uh, is a substantial part of discretionary spending of the United States, depending on who you're talking to and what math. It's anywhere from uh, 40 to 45 percent. So we're spending our national treasure on war. We're a war machine as a nation. We prefer war over health care. We prefer war over housing. We prefer war over education. We prefer war over the economic welfare of our own citizens. And uh, this is something that more and more people are catching on to. And unfortunately, the last ones to catch on appear to be members of the United States Congress. So how are decisions about war? made. Um, we see the public shills for war, the same people, uh, whether it's Iraq or Libya or Syria or Afghanistan, uh, these neocons who are well known, uh, who brought us the war, uh, you know, 20 years of warfare in the Middle East. Uh, but they are, are spokespeople for obviously the war industry. Uh, so, it, it, you know, if we look back at the last two decades, it's just fiasco after fiasco. I mean, nobody can describe any of these wars as a success. Uh, who's making these decisions and why is it bipartisan? The decisions to go to war ostensibly would be made at the administration level. However, uh, there is a, uh, a broad network of uh, public policy groups uh, masquerading as independent voices, uh, think tanks, uh, academic uh, organizations, uh, people in the media who feed into any kind of narrative that would prompt the country to start to rattle the sabers or determine, well, we need to go here in order to defend our national interest. Uh, so once once that appropriation process starts, you know, let's keep in mind, you know, they have, you know, close to a trillion dollars in all accounts. You know, they're on their own. I mean, that money's fungible. That money's there, which enables the United States at this very moment to send two aircraft carrier uh, uh, units out out into the um, uh, area near uh, near Israel. Now, you have to wonder what's that all about? And what it's all about is that the United States right now has the money to be able to send troops anywhere they want in the world or to pay for the ones that are already stationed. And uh, they put the country at the threshold of a war the minute they do that. Uh, and when I say of a war, I mean of actual combat interactions. And the people who are pushing for this, we have to keep in mind that one of the things that drags us into war is an ideological. Uh, mindset uh, today in the United States. It's sponsored by a group uh, famously known as neoconservatives who see uh, uh, America as a, uh, as a force uh, fighting against uh, evil all over the world. Uh, and the Manichaean struggle, which they uh, invite, is one that is generally of their own making uh, the uh, desire to be able to create wars and to cash in. I mean, there are earnings reports coming out lately where some of the uh, war contractors or those who hold them in a the portfolio are citing what a great thing it is for, for the profits that are going to come as a result of what's happening in the Middle East right now. It's unconscionable, but we're in this cycle where we have a war dependent economy. And the more that we spend on, on war material, the more likely are uh, we are to go to war, the more people we have at forward base around the world, the more likely we are to go to war. When an international crisis develops, such as has developed uh, uh, after uh, uh, mo most famously uh, signed October 7, 2023, uh, we then see things go into motion that will support and justify the reason why we are there to begin with. And then from there, you go on to additional appropriations. And one of the things that I want to point out, the over $14 billion which will, uh, which Congress will vote on, uh, perhaps uh, 
uh, uh, in the uh, uh, at, at the beginning of November. Once Congress votes on that, forget declarations of war, Article One, Section Eight, the role of Congress, and in, in balancing off the executive's uh, uh, desire to go to war. Forget all that. Once the money is there, we're there. We're stuck. And it's kind of like gamblers in for a dime, in for a dollar. Once we put that money down, we are at war, whether it's declared or not. And this is the danger of the moment that we're in right now, because the American people, unless they can convince their members of Congress, for whatever reason, you know, whether it's uh, uh, as one member of Congress, Tom Massey from Kentucky, says, you know, we can't afford it. That's one way. Another way is to say, don't fuel the fire. Another way is to say, stop killing the Gazans. I mean, there are so many different reasons to avoid it, but the American people have to be heard from immediately, call their members of Congress to say, don't fund the war. If we have to, if they're so so uh, intent on spending money, spend it for diplomacy, spend it for humanitarian purposes, spend it for food, shelter, clothing, electricity, water, anything to try to relieve people from the uh, uh, from the veil of tears they're in right now and the fears for their life. But right now, you know, our country, we are ready for war. And it's not just about uh, uh, funding an effort uh, against uh, the people of Gaza, but it's about getting ready for war against Iran, which would be catastrophic for the United States and for Israel. So I I think that we're really at a crossroads right here, Chris, and I, the piece that I wrote in Substack kind of outlines the contours of it, because this war has uh, both, it's not just geographical, it is ethnic and it is religious. Um, you have a situation where once the money comes in, it's not a congressional decision, it's a unilateral decision by the White House uh, to, for instance, to send these carriers. No, Biden didn't consult anybody. That may be Jake Sullivan, who probably made the decision for Biden. But it, 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 all that power, that potential to essentially uh, trigger a war is in the hands of the presidency. It's a, Congress isn't even part of the decision. Once the money is there, and this is what I'd, I'd like your viewers to understand, you know, you have the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, which the founders clearly put the power to uh, make war in the hands of the House because they didn't want an executive just roaming the world looking for. Uh, enemies to slay, as Adams famously warned about. But if the Congress want, you know, uh, approves an appropriation that the president then wants to take uh, to uh, create a war, courts have held pretty consistently that Congress's ultimate power is the power of the purse. And if Congress wants to stop a war, don't fund it. If Congress wants to start a war, fund it. But Congress cannot go back after it funds a war and say, oh, we didn't mean that. We didn't mean for him to escalate. Hey, once they have the money, the administration, the president as commander in chief under the Constitution is able to uh, use that uh, war material in any way that he or in the future she would please. And yet we see no pushback. I mean, the last budget, I think the Congress gave the Pentagon forty billion dollars more than they even requested. There, there's and in in many ways the Democratic Party is worse. Yeah, it's it's um, uh, it's become reflexive. The inability to ask questions about why. I mean, only after the fact will you see inspectors gener inspector generals reports come back and say, "Well, you know, you misspent billions here, billions there." After a while, it adds up. You go back to uh, uh, Major General Smedley Butler, uh, who had won two medals of honor for his service to the country at the uh, beginning of the uh, 20th century, and he concluded, famously, war's a racket. And this is a racket. And the members of Congress just go along. It's, look, let's face it, uh, once uh, Citizens United uh, became the law of the land and uh, uh, money equaled free speech from the corporate standpoint, all this entire defense establishment was emboldened to just pour money into congressional races, and they do, and they do it, you know, openly through, uh, uh, through you know, five thousand dollar contributions or whatever they're allowed right now. 
and in addition to that, super PACs, which can uh, make a difference in a congressional or Senate race. So, you know, we have a, a almost a closed loop system that guarantees that we will continue to go to war. And there is no counterbalance for diplomacy or peace. That doesn't exist. The Department of State is there to rattle the saber, as uh, the current Secretary of State Blinken has proven. The National Security Advisor Sullivan, he's there to keep fulminating. And of course, uh, we we know about the general lady who is a, uh, a deputy secretary who has uh, famously uh, uh, kept her uh, neoconservative credentials alive since uh, the beginning of her service. Uh, to the United States as somebody who promotes war. So we have an entire uh, uh, phalanx of people at the administrative level who are promoting it every day. And they're supported by the think tanks, academics, the media. People don't question. And so we we get pulled into this maw of, of war, and then people wonder why. Well, watch when American troops uh, when their lives are put online, they're already being out there as bait, as far as I'm concerned. Our troops are in that region as bait. And uh, and if and when uh, the troops start to die and you get reports, maybe some have already, but if and when that starts to happen in, in large numbers, the American people are going to be horrified. Uh, but, you know, the, money's go- the money could go out this week unless people call and object strongly. That's the way you stop a war. Stop funding it. What they're playing with, as you've written, is a very dangerous global conflagration. It's like, you know, throwing, tossing lit matches in towards pools of gasoline, uh, not only in the Ukraine uh, and not only in the Middle East, but also with China. Uh, I mean, the consequences are potentially catastrophic. I mean, in the case of China and Russia, we're dealing, of course, with nuclear powers. And then, of course, Israel has nuclear weapons. There's nothing to stop Israel from using a tactical nuclear weapon on Iran. Talk a little bit about how this could all go bad. You know, when we have these discussions about the danger which uh, we can sense uh, lies ahead, uh, we, we, we have to uh, look at things not, uh, not out of fear, but out of a, you know, a cold strategic analysis. Uh, the United States and, and Israel are seen as uh, simultaneous in uh, the actions in Gaza right now. Uh, that has uh, created a furor, uh, particularly in the, in the Arab and, and in the Muslim world. Uh, the uh, head of Turkey, uh, Erdogan, uh, just yesterday uh, gave a speech to about a million people where he warned about uh, he he in, invoked the image of the uh, crescent versus the cross. You know we're talking crusades here, folks. Uh, the idea that if if the United States and and Israel are aimed at trying to wipe out uh, people who are Arabs and and most of whom are Muslims, what does that say to the rest of the Muslim world? Which uh, Nine million people in, in Israel, uh, maybe a million and a half of them Palestinians, uh, in the er- larger Arab world surrounding Israel, hundreds of millions of Muslims and Arabs who are watching people in Gaza being slaughtered. So the emotional turmoil that comes from that then is informed by a very deep religious uh, sentiment that is being provoked by the first week of October, ultra-nationalists marching from Temple Mount into Al-Aqsa and rearranging the furniture, shall we say politely. It could be, depending on who you talk to, uh, that what we experienced on October 7th, notwithstanding the apparently uh, very thorough planning that went on, that we had an Al-Aqsa Intifada as a flashpoint because the the destruction or the desecration of anything at Al-Aqsa is going to be uh, uh, responded to. And uh, there are those in the uh, the ultra-nationalists 
who are already to try to push uh, the Palestinians out of Gaza, push them up, and, you know, kill them, and, uh, and then the Palestinians in West Bank, and to fulfill a dream uh, that for them has biblical um, uh, authorization for the uh, fulfillment of the land of Israel, and, uh, and, and then to build, uh, rebuild the third temple, uh, which, of course, would annihilate Al-Aqsa. When we start to get into, into religious sentiments and beliefs that go back thousands of years, and we have people motivated by prophecy, can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And it can lead to, uh, you know, it can lead right to the, the Bible, which talks about uh, uh, Armageddon, you know, the apocalypse. I mean, this is, we're, that's why we have to take this seriously. We can't just pretend, well, that'll never happen. Actually, it's moving in that direction right now. The leader of Turkey pronouncing uh, crescent versus cross, you know, raising, raising the issue. Are we coming to that? We can't, this is, this is a, you know, I, I often talk about Barbara Tuckman's book, uh, The March of Folly where she writes as a historian, it's nothing new under humanity for leaders to prepare a, a course of action and execute it that is totally con uh, antithetical to the interests of their uh, country. And this is what uh, you know, Mr. Netanyahu is doing with support from the right wing in Israel uh, in, in enacting this, uh, uh, this, this biblical phraseology that he is quoting lately. There's a game being played here that is so dangerous that could pull us all into not just a regional war, but a world war. And so those are some of the uh, uh, antecedents uh, that we have to consider when we're looking at an analysis of what we could be facing. And why isn't the Biden administration offering any restraint? I mean, canceling or vetoing the ceasefire resolution at the UN, uh, giving more military aid. It's not just they're passive, but they're actively involved. Why? Well, first of all, you have to look at President Biden himself. He he has never really been anyone who has uh, said, "Whoa, wait a minute, let's not do this." He's generally been congenial to uh, to voting for war as a senator and voting for certainly uh, uh, defense uh, or Pentagon appropriations. So that's that's where it's. And then who surrounds him? The, the neocons that are, are his closest advisors. And they're spoiling for a war against Iran. This has been going on since Bush was president. There's no question about I mean, I gave about 150 speeches just on Iran alone, where I saw the Bush administration was actually talking about a nuclear, a strike on a nuclear research lab at Bashir. And I pointed out in the speech in Congress, we go ahead and do that. We're going to be creating a radioactive fallout around uh, a good part of the globe. And is that something we're thinking about? So this is, uh, uh, is there an intention to take us right to the, uh, uh, to the precipice here of a war? Absolutely. You can't say they're just, you know, stumbling into this. No, they're, these people are not stupid. I mean, I might question these, the rationale, and I do, behind their decisions, but they're ideologically driven. And some would have said, look, uh, just as uh, let's use this to go after Iran, just like the pronouncement was made after 9-11, let's use this to go after Iraq. And it's the declensions of war. You know, Iraq, Iran, I run to hell. Why Iran? I mean, the, uh, the, I mean you, have, you have oil in Iran, you have more oil in Iraq. <clears throat> what is it? Do they think that it, is it just this vision that they're going to remake the Middle East into their own image. What do you think is driving this animus towards Iran? And of course, we have to be clear, Bibi Netanyahu has been pushing for a strike on Iran for a long time. And it's my understanding that the Pentagon has essentially been very wary about carrying out strikes against Iran. Well, you know, I spoke to, I, I had a chance to talk to uh, uh, Mr. Netanyahu when, as a member of Congress on a committee that he testified to. And uh, he, he uh, at this committee, he said, well, the United States ought to go after this. Chris, this could have been 25 years ago. 
that the United States should go after Iraq, Iran, and Syria. And after the hearing, I met him in the hall, and I said, Mr. Netanyahu, uh, why don't you do it? And he said, oh, no, 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 no. You should do it. Um, this is a, you know, leaders go to war for all kinds of reasons. Some reasons that they may be in political trouble and they think war is going to save them. That can be part of Netanyahu's calculus. could also be part of Joe Biden's calculus. Uh, you know, wartime president, don't change horse in the middle of the stream, on and on and on. Uh, Iran, I think, uh, in, in its uh, nuclear research, represented a threat to Israel that, uh, um, you know, people who were otherwise condign on the issue of Iran said, hey, wait a minute, we better look at this. You know, we don't really see eye to eye. They could try to strike us. And, you know, in the dialectic of conflict, it goes into the calculus of a nuclear exchange. If you think the other guy's going to hit you, you might hit him first. And so uh, that's one thing. Iran has uh, rose, uh, risen as a technological power. Uh, it, it's, it's not an Arab country. It is Persian. And, it's, and it's, um, uh, it, it has developed a uh, society which is advanced. Uh, it's, it's not well understood by the United States uh, that, that the people of Iran uh, they're not afraid of America. They don't expect to be attacked. But if they're attacked, they will respond and they'll be ready. And they've developed some very um, uh, accurate uh, missiles that can travel thousands of miles. Uh, the, the thing that I'm concerned about is that in this dialectic of conflict that uh, we're seeing uh, move along in, in, es in, in an escalatory fashion, look, this could mean the end of Israel. I don't know why that isn't, I mean, I'm sure people in Israel are living with this, are starting to get concerned, hey, where is this headed? But we cannot in, in, create a war with Iran without expecting a retaliatory strike with everything that Iran has on Israel itself. So, you know, it's like back off, stop it. Stop this, um, this, this forward momentum towards a cataclysm. To what extent do you think these neocons who have orchestrated these debacles in the Middle East essentially are using Iran as a scapegoat? I mean, they made the mess, uh, but are they kind of trying to offload it onto Iran? And once we get rid of Iran, our kind of utopian vision of the Middle East will appear. Oh, I think that's part of it. No question about it. Uh, it. it you know, I've got a library here. A lot of the books uh, recently in the last 20 years are about Iraq. And it's very interesting how you can see the parallels between uh, uh, what we're doing in um, uh, with respect to Iran right now. Now, the CIA the reports that I saw, the, you know, did not say that Iran was directly linked to what happened on October 7th. Uh, but there are those who want to create that connection now in order to blame Iran for that, just as uh, we falsely blamed Iraq for 9-11. And Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11. And according to our own intelligence agencies, uh, Iran was not connected to October 7th. So there is this, um, uh, it, it, it really goes back to the project for a new American century. Uh, you know, we're talking about a, a just as there are uh, are plans in in Iraq that are driven by uh, history and ideology and and politics. So too in the United States, there are plans that are driven by uh, similar metrics, and it puts us in a position where we're we're moving towards a war against Iran, and and we're not really thinking about where is this going to take us. I mean, all of this, you know, the the ships, the carriers, the planes that we've already sent over, ostensibly to protect Israel. No, no it, it they're they're really in a in a forward ready position to be able to deploy for an attack on Iran, and we're not fooling anyone. Least of all, 
Iran on this. Iran's been preparing uh, for this for some time. And then one has to ask, as you know, war planners sometimes do, where does this lead? China's already standing uh, with Iran. We are already opposed to Russia and the games that were played uh, with respect to Ukraine. So where do we go? We are looking at a conflict that inevitably will take us against two other nuclear powers, China and Russia. I, I, who's Isn't anybody aware of how dangerous this situation is with respect to standing guard for Israel while they go ahead and uh, the, the government uh, just levels Gaza and kills hundreds of thousands of people, perhaps? We, somebody has to say, look, we're, we're playing in the flash of World War III here, and we, we ought to stop. And it's, it's beyond a ceasefire. There has to be a stand down and, and just stop it so that Israel can be secured from destruction, so that the Gazans can be protected from destruction, so that the, those in the West Bank can be protected from destruction so that our nation and the nations of the world can be protected from destruction. One need only go back to the poetry of, uh, of William Yates when he famously wrote The Second Coming, turning and turning in a widening gyre. The falcon cannot hear the falconer. All things fall apart. The center cannot hold. And what we're seeing here is the, the center of gravity that holds the world together right now is starting to fracture. And once that happens, uh, the potential for uh, a very wide war uh, is introduced. And once it starts, it plays itself out as wars always do over, you know, as a depending on what kind of weapons are used. Well, and those carrier groups are not deployed in the Mediterranean. They're deployed in the Persian Gulf off the coast of Iran. Right. Thank you. You're right about that. Uh, so it's a very clear threat to Iran. And, and, that's why, and that's why they're there in the Persian Gulf. Iran, Persian. Hello? Yeah. Great. We can find you at denniskucinich.substack.com. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that's my Substack address. Right. Okay. I'm a subscriber. Everyone else should subscribe. That was, Thank you. Uh, Anybody wants to subscribe, you're... Uh, <laughs> Subscriptions are gratefully received. <laughs> that was Dennis Kucinich. I want to thank the Real News Network and its production team, Cameron Granadino, Adam Coley, David Hebden, and Kayla Rivera. You can find me at chrishedges.substack.com. <laughs>